We are joined in the studio today by Sarah Atherton. Um, Sarah, lots to talk about in this month's catch up. But of course, the one thing that is um, probably the most pressing issue and has created quite a lot of debate since the news broke last night to the public in Wrexham is the Leavening Up Fund. Um, could you talk to us a bit more about the Leavening Up Fund, please? Yes, I, I will. Uh, and Happy New Year, everyone. Um, incredibly, incredibly disappointed um, that Wrexham Council wasn't awarded the Leveling Up Fund bid in the second round. <sighs> yeah, big sigh there. Um, Long term plans for the Gateway project remain. It is a setback, um, and we need to just have a, t- a period of reflection uh, and regroup as a city and look at what next. Uh, but it, it is. Um, it is part of a, a wider context of, of what's going on in Wrexham, and we must really try and put it into context. Uh, Wrexham, if you, I remember looking back, I was thinking this morning in my period of reflection, and I was looking back to where we were, say, in 2018, 2019, uh, and Wrexham was Spice Town, uh, with tumbleweed along the high street. And then I think what's happened in the past few years, and Wrexham's done incredibly well. Uh, We're a city. The King visited last year. We were runners up in the City of Culture bid due to run again in um, 2029 with a good chance of getting it this time. We've been awarded 24 million for the Share Prosperity Fund, which we're going to discuss a bit later, hopefully. Uh, And we've already won one levelling up fund bid or the council have already won one levelling up fund bid for the Trevor Basin for 13 million. It is a, a huge disappointment. But we've come a long way and I'm really sure and positive that as a community, the football club, the council, myself, the university, relevant stakeholders, the supporters and Repsom as a whole will just regalvanise, either look at plan B or look at resubmitting a bid in the third round. So we've done really well. It is a disappointment, but onwards and upwards uh, and we'll keep going. I mean, it's, it's a subject that we have had a huge amount of feedback from our listeners on a lot of disappointment, especially now, I think, with the profile of the football club. I think that's also fueled some of the frustration there because I think people have sort of almost got an expectation of um, the progress, there, haven't they? Um, there's a couple of things. I think, Aaron, you've got a bit of feedback in a moment. If I can ask a question, is one thing a lot of our listeners said is why has South Wales got so much compared to North Wales? It seems to be quite a contentious topic. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the reason why um, there's not one council in Wales, first of all, that has got a second bid. There's, a, there's 22 councils. You know, money is tight. It would be unreasonable to give a council two bids. We've already won one. There was no preference given at the early stages of, of which was preferred, the Gateway or the Trevor Basin. We've won one. North Wales has done incredibly well on the second round. So um, I think... I think the Dallin MP didn't get his bid. Uh, James Davis didn't get his bid for real, and I didn't get mine. Everywhere else now in North Wales has had a bid. So we've done well. <clears throat> Wales has done incredibly well. And in fact, when you look at all the regions, excuse me, <clears throat> when you look at all the regions of the UK, Wales has done as a whole doesn't help me in the way I feel today, but Wales as a whole has done incredibly well. Per person, the levelling up fund bid has given Wales an extra £67. Now you compare that to Scotland, which is £32, and London, which is £17. So Wales has done the best per region for levelling up. So that's something to hold on to, although it doesn't make me feel much better today. And of course, the, the passionate topic of football in Wrexham, of course, is intertwined with this um, whole debate. Um, Aaron, you had um, some feedback, didn't you, from listeners with a question there? Uh, yeah, just one of the listeners has, has come in and asked, uh, what are your thoughts on the statement released by uh, Mr Humphrey Carr um, earlier on today? Yeah, I, do you know what? I think we just need to realise Wrexham has done well. This is a setback, uh, as the football club has said. Uh, you know, there are other plans, there are other ways we can perhaps look at the gateway bid. Uh, we need to go forward as a team, as Team Wrexham, to make sure that that gateway project actually happens, because that's what's important to me right now. Uh, we need to work together to, for the betterment of Wrexham. It's, it, you know, it's raw today. 
it's very raw today. I'm very raw today and very sad and disappointed. But we'll just keep going because we've done incredibly well so far and we'll keep rising Wrexham. And that's what Wrexham does, isn't it? It keeps on rising. So you mentioned um, the Prosperity Fund. Um, let's um, discuss that then and your, your reflections on that. Yes, yeah, so um, when we left the European Union, Brexit, uh, we no longer receive money from the European Union via the UK government. Uh, the money comes directly from the UK government. Uh, and we fought long and hard to make sure that doesn't go via Welsh government uh, because of something you, you sort of hinted on before, the North-South divide, that it comes directly to councils. And that's something that we lobbied hard on as a parliamentary group in London. So Wrexham Council from the UK government has been awarded 22.4 million pounds uh, to spend locally. And that's called the Shared Prosperity Fund. Now they've got that money uh, and they need to start spending it. So they've got a framework about how people, charities, organizations can bid for that. It's gonna be divided into two, pots of money under the value of 250,000 and then money over grants awards over 250,000. So uh, they're just about to open a link so people can apply uh, on the Rexham website. Uh, I will also be putting that on my website when it's up, it is delayed. Um, so I keep pushing the council to find out what date that will be open. Uh, so as soon as it is, we'll let everybody know so charities can then put their applications in uh, to bid towards that. For the larger grants of £250,000 or more, there's going to be a partnership panel that will look at approving those grants and all stakeholders in Wrexham, the council, myself, elected representatives will be on that uh, to make sure that the money is going in the right direction. The whole aim of the Share Prosperity Fund is to increase um, pride in place. And in particular, I did a survey of what residents in Wrexham wanted from the Share Prosperity Fund. We may have mentioned it before. It's no surprise, it's town centre regeneration. Toilet blocks, a toilet facility in Wrexham or more accessible public toilets is high on the agenda as well, which is something that I've been working with the council on. I haven't got very far with that yet, but, but I keep going with that because it's vitally important. Uh, homelessness accommodation. These are all the sort of things that could be uh, applied for in grant funding from the Share Prosperity Fund. So this is incredibly important. It's incredibly exciting. It could really change Wrexham. I hope the bids are awarded to town centre regeneration projects, uh, but we'll see what Wrexham want because it's it's their money, their money to spend. And what's sort of the period of this um, expenditure likely to be? The time frame for applications for the £250,000 or, or, or less. Well, I'm just looking at my notes here. The count, it's run by the council and I'm yet to have that confirmed. I hope it's not a short window of application. Um, I hope it's longer than two weeks, which is something I've got here. Um, but it's yet to be confirmed. And certainly, you know, it needs to be a bit more of a running feast, I think. We can't just have a two-week window of application because that wouldn't be fair. So that's something I'd look at and something I'll let you know about. And in terms of the timescale, how long is this funding intended to last for? Uh, I think the council are pretty keen that it's it spent sooner rather than later, but the money is in the bank. Uh, it's for the council to decide on that. Um, whilst some of our, our charities get funding from Welsh government um, and they will probably apply as well. I also hope that larger projects will consider applying, for example, in the town centre. Uh, and of course, the larger projects will take more of the money up than the smaller projects. So it will depend on what projects come in, what the people of Wrexham uh, and the charities uh, want. Uh, so that money will probably be spent proportionately depending on the applications. If we move on then, um, an update on the subject of transport. We've talked about this in some of our previous conversations. Um, how are things currently looking in terms of transport and the work you've been doing there? Yeah, so I've got a, a little bit of my bonnet really about transport and connectivity for reps. And now we're in New City and I'm constantly going on about the trains. I had a, a decent train service early this morning that actually got me through to Chester and then, then a train from Chester. Um, that wasn't bad. Some of the train journeys I've had over the last 
few weeks have been appalling. And you'll obviously know in government, we're constantly barracking and lobbying uh, of anti-West Coast. Uh, but we're a new city. We need to be pro-growth uh, and pro-business and pro-transport. And I did mention in the chamber yesterday in Wales questions, uh, the policy that the Welsh Government are bringing in from September this year uh, about the 20 mile an hour in urban area policy. I did a, a survey of constituents and 94% um, don't agree with what the Welsh Government are doing there. We all agree 20 mile an hour outside schools, hospitals, play groups, um, play areas is absolutely merited. Um, but slowing a blanket, a, a ban of slowing everyone down will only cause good drivers to become criminals. It's also going to cost £32 million. And by the Welsh Government's own analysis, uh, it's going to cost the Welsh economy £4.5 billion in slowing Wales down. So this is something I've been working on at the moment. I suspect the Welsh Government has already ticked the boxes and it's going to go in, into place uh, from September this year, but very disappointed about that. Um, Welsh Government claimed that that will save £100 million. And I did a, a Freedom of Information request to find out how they came to that conclusion. Uh, I wasn't um, convinced by the, the piece of seven page document I received from, I think it was Nate. Here, university I might be wrong there that the Welsh government had commissioned and anyone that had written in to me about this I did send them that evidence so they could make up their own mind about whether they think this is a good idea so um, <clears throat> we are where we are with transport I'm really keen that we have more active transport links particularly around these new developments we see um, you know disappointed that we're not seeing smaller buses being used on the new developments around Fly, for example, um, so they've got connectivity to Wrexham with smaller buses, because obviously the, the problem we have in Wrexham, some of the larger Arriva buses, they just say they can't get round, round the corners and traffic stops them uh, getting to where they want to be, particularly around the Watts Dyke area. You know, if we had smaller buses, uh, we could offer a better bus service. So I'm really keen that on our new developments, we have good pavements, good cycle routes, good connectivity into Wrexham and space for buses. So this is something that I'm always quite keen on when I talk about um, development and talk to developers and the council. There's a couple of concerns again that listeners have raised and I know they've come up on other conversations as well in the area. One of them is Arriva apparently having somewhat of a monopoly on bus services. Um, do you see sort of anything changing in the future in terms of getting more operators to provide services? We had more operators. Um, <clears throat> I think the problem there is that Arriva is a big enough company that can distribute the cost and loss of services because when I was first elected, I spoke to a couple of bus companies that were really struggling because footfall passengers on their coaches and buses uh, was quite small and it wasn't affordable. It wasn't cost effective to keep running these routes. And my argument was, well, I feel the council have an obligation here. You go abroad, you find fantastic bus routes of all different shapes and sizes and designs of buses. Um, <clears throat> and I spoke to the council about this, but it's very much a commercial operation. That's how the council see that going forward. Smaller bus routes couldn't afford to run, whereas Arriva, I believe the number one bus route from Chester to Epsom is one of the most profitable in Wales. And that can offset, for example, buses going around the conurbations like Boris and Recessney uh, to link that. So it's economies of scale, really. The bigger bus companies can afford the losses of the quieter routes. And that's why I say to people, when we do have bus routes starting up again post-COVID, please, please use them. Because if you don't use them, we will lose them. And of course, the other big concern recently, there's been a lot of talk about increased train services, particularly those running through uh, Guersilk towards Liverpool. And then the news more recently that the supplier had um, hit bankruptcy. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that and, and you know, the, the potential ramifications of that? Are you talking about the Rex and Bidston line? That's right, yes. Yeah. Um, well, as far as I, I'm aware, uh, the Rex and Bidston line is going to be electrified uh, and be more direct into Liverpool from autumn this year. I hadn't heard that that was going to change. Uh, but a lot can happen between now and, and autumn this year. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of commitment towards that direct line from Wrexham into Liverpool. Uh, 
Um, so we'll keep a watching brief on that. And we'll let you know if anything changes. Fantastic. Um, so Glyndor University then, of course, um, playing a huge role in, you know, Wrexham historically and currently with some of the new things happening. They're um, a big player in the whole uh, plans to redevelop um, that area of Wrexham, the gateway into Wrexham. Um, and a lot of other stuff happening as well at Glyndor, isn't there? Yes, I went to visit Glyndor the other day. Uh, I'm very keen to look at their nursing programme that they're doing there. I know that, um, that I wasn't supposed to speak about this, but I'm incredibly proud, proud of what Wrexham is doing around nurse education and recruitment. And obviously training as a nurse at Wrexham myself, I'm really keen that we grow our own nurses, particularly in this current climate. And Colly Cambria, who I'm going to visit tomorrow, do a nurse cadet scheme. Um, and a lot of those cadets will train at the Myla, the 16 to 18, they'll train at the Myla. They, they may, may go on to the nurse uh, university education at Glyndor and go to the Myla again. So I'm incredibly proud that um, Repsom's got together to address nurse training because it's close to my heart. But equally, it's a difficult time for everybody. And the Glyndor University Student Union have set up a help your shelf cupboard um, where People can drop off food donations, stationery and uh, sanitary products and comforts for students who are struggling. Uh, and they can come along at Students' Union uh, without stigma, without question, uh, unless they are seeking further help uh, and uh, take some supplies off the shelf. Uh, so it was really lovely to go there. And they're looking for a fridge so they can start to supply fresh goods. So if anyone's got a fridge there, I thought I had one in my garage. It wasn't, it was a washing machine. Um, but if anyone's got a fridge stashed away anywhere, the student union's desperate uh, for a fridge so they can start providing uh, fresh goods to students who are perhaps are struggling. Uh, but also I spoke to them about hardship funds. Um, and at the moment now, um, the uptake for the hardship fund isn't isn't as high as you might expect as a, as a sad thing to say actually uh, but they're looking at what are the barriers to students applying for the hardship fund and we spoke about a few of those barriers and the student union there and the student support officer is looking at how to make that hardship fund more accessible so they're doing some great work there at the university Fantastic. Thank you. Now, of course, you are Wrexham's representative in the Houses of Parliament, and I believe you are currently working on a really interesting um, exhibition project at the moment. Yes, so um, Battle of Britain, Wales's contribution to the Battle of Britain. Uh, slightly forgotten, but no longer, uh, because the RAF uh, MOD have done a fantastic Wales and the Battle of Britain display that started off at the Senate. And 200 days later, um, ended in Parliament. And it was sponsored by myself and Minister James Davis from the Wales office. Uh, and it was lovely to showcase really what Wales, how it contributed to the RAF uh, and the Battle of Britain during World War II. Uh, and it's amazing in the northeast of Wales how much we committed. And there was um, a Spitfire called Wrexham. So Wrexham contributed, the good people of Wrexham contributed and they built a Spitfire uh, with donations and it was called the Wrexham Spitfire. So that was really lovely to see. Uh, and it was really good to show uh, the rest of the parliamentarians, cross party, what Wales actually did uh, during the Battle of Britain. Uh, so that was really a, a proud moment. And of course, we took Welsh cakes down and had a pan -ed or two and uh, some daffodils. And uh, we really try and promote Wales in Parliament. Uh, I did not know ever that there was a Spitfire named Rex. I think that's a fantastic little bit of trivia and um, uh, yet another little um, thing for Rex to be proud of, right? Oh, absolutely. And then yesterday we had an Airbus reception. So just in case I forget to mention it, uh, the fantastic Airbus open days that we all know and love. And we've all taken kids and nephews and sons and daughters along uh, to see whether they want to be apprentices. Uh, Airbus. That's happening this Saturday. So if you haven't got your invite yet, just go on the website and you can uh, apply to go. That's this Saturday. But Airbus had an event in Parliament to showcase their helicopters, their rotary blade uh, provision that they do now. Uh, Airbus is pitching a bid for the MOD for the helicopter, the H175M, which is a medium lift military helicopter to replace the Puma. And obviously, with my defence hat on, I've been working hard behind the scenes to try and encourage the MOD to look favourably on Airbus's 
pitch. Um, we'll probably know towards the end of this year. They're up against stiff competition with Leonardo. Uh, but obviously, I'm keen that Airbus get it because if they do, their helicopters will be built at Broughton. And obviously, that's going to bring more apprenticeships, more jobs, more prosperity uh, and more money into the area. So that's something that I've been working on for a long time and we'll keep going. So that's, uh, that's my work with Airbus at the moment. I mean, all things considered, we've got quite a lot of aviation history embedded in North Wales, haven't we? We certainly have. I mean, we've got the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and the <clears throat> statue that's going up, hopefully around St David's Day, outside Hightown Barracks. We've got revival of Hightown Barracks. Uh, so I was concerned a few years back that there's going to be uh, housing development, but it's now thriving as a barracks. And we've got the Battle of Britain. And we, of course, we shouldn't forget our Royal Navy Naval Association. Um, and we're, I'm working hard behind the scenes, hopefully, to try and get perhaps one of the new ships that the UK government is building, uh, twinned with Wrexham. It won't be HMS Wrexham, uh, but it will be twinned with Wrexham. So, you know, if we can just tick that box, uh, we've got all three. That would be fantastic. Um, I'm appreciative of how little time you've got because you are very busy. But just before we do conclude today's conversation, if we could have a little look at retail in Wrexham, there's been some really interesting developments, haven't there, recently in the retail sector? Yes, so I've done walkabouts and met the management team at Eagles Meadow, uh, and I'm really pleased what's going to be happening there with Debenhams. Uh, it's unconfirmed, but hopefully it's going to be a food, drinks and entertainment hall, looking at different cultural foods, so that could be quite exciting. Upstairs might be something different around entertainment, but uh, TBC on that one. Uh, I'm really pleased that Next Outlet is coming to Island Green. Just be careful if you're parking there. Uh, bane of my life, uh, Island Green Parking, uh, but we'll keep fighting the good fight on that one. Uh, and then I had a walk about the Chapter Fort. Uh, so their development uh, is going to be incremental. So stage one, and I think everyone that walks around Wrexham can see the units there are ready to go. Hopefully next month or the month after, we'll see our first retail unit in there. There are 40 retailers lining up, jockeying, hopefully jockeying, uh, to get a place there. So uh, that's sounding really good at the moment. And then the second part uh, of the plan is at the back, um, at the back of the hub, which is like this, this courtyard, it's a car park, and they're hoping to make it into an events venue, drinks, um, outdoor seating uh, place. Uh, and hopefully they're looking to, to do that towards the end of the year, all being well with the retail side of things. So. Things are starting to, very slowly, are starting to move in Wrexham. And I, you know, I feel it's going to be a domino effect. The first one will come and we'll just push that domino down and then all the others will flow. Well, that's what we're hoping anyway. And certainly, just Chapter Court, what they're proposing is a fantastic um, magnet to draw people back into the city centre, isn't it? Well, we've, we've got that whole area now. We've got TechniQuest. Uh, it's starting to look really quite attractive. Uh, and we've got the work starting on the butcher's market very soon. That's going to be a long term plan, um, but it's going to be a food, drink, sort of bespoke sort of eatery place. I suspect a bit like Chester uh, has turned their market into. Um, there's lots of markets like that. You're only going to have to go to York or Borough Market in London. I think that's the whole concept design uh, for the market there. And I think we have to be realistic. Our town centres are changing. And what people want from our town centres are changing. And I think Wrexham is uh, stepping up to the market and trying to change to attract people back into the town centre. So despite some setbacks in certain areas, all things considered right now is Wrexham's had a really quite fantastic start to the year, hasn't it? Well, yes, it has. It's had a, it's had a really good couple of years and we'll keep going. We're going to get setbacks. Of course we are. But, you know, it's about working together. It's about working together for the betterment of Wrexham, regardless of your politics, regardless of your, you know, your status or who you are, and realising at the end of the day, you know, our legacy to our children and grandchildren is Wrexham. Uh, and we need to bear that in mind because people will come and go, um, but Wrexham is always here to stay. Sarah, thank you ever so much for your time today. As always, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon.